Hello, and welcome to Images in Video, the killer use case for cloud storage. I'm Dave Elliott, product lead responsible for storage here in Google's cloud platform. My background is storage and storage in the enterprise. We're here today to talk with you about some of the unique challenges in storing and accessing media and some innovative solutions from Google. I'm Jeff Kember, and I'm a cloud solutions architect. I've had the pleasure of working at different companies such as ILM, Pixar, Framestore, and Blizzard. I'm here to chat with you today about some of the media requirements as well as different use cases from customers. Great, so let's get started. So today's agenda will start with Jeff sharing his experiences in dealing with media and sharing some key requirements for storing and accessing video, images, and audio files. Then I'll introduce object storage and cloud storage and discuss how they are well suited to media assets. Next, I'll briefly talk a little bit about Google Cloud Storage and how it's differentiated from other cloud object stores. And we'll finish with a few examples of where Google Cloud Storage is used today. Jeff, you want to take it? Absolutely. Dave, so I spent most of my career dealing with large files of disparate types and sizes. And one of the defining aspects for me of media files is just how, how many files you, you can have. You can have many, many small files. You can have very, very large files. You can have files that derive other files. So if you have a mezzanine file, for instance, for streaming, you'll have the entire film, and then you'll have to produce 28 different flavors of it. You'll have to make different bit rates, different resolutions, different codecs for different platforms, and all of that storage is challenging to predict in size. Um, more complex, though, is the fact that users now have 4K cameras in their pocket and they're shooting video. Um, there's applications that are running on all the platforms that are just ingesting a massive amount of content. And when we talk about media files, we're, we're talking about not just video, but, but I assume audio and images as well. There's a lot of similarities across all of those types of files, right? Correct, yeah. So from a media standpoint, I've been working with audio files, tons of imagery, video files, and various hybrids of those different types. And the source files can be kept in multiple versions and then recombined. I see. So you end up having multiple versions of the various files in different stages of production. That's one of the size, growth, scalability issues. Got it. So size, growth, scalability, one of the kind of defining features of all types of media. OK, great, great. So what else are you seeing with media? Uh, they're, they're, it's growing. It's growing rapidly. So what, what, how does that translate into a, a requirement for storage? Well, we made a transition from standard def to high def many years ago, and everything is pretty much 1080p now. And moving forward, though, 4K has caught on in the last couple of years. We're seeing that it's not a fad. It's an actual growth trend for us. Customers are paying for 4K content. It's not a fad. All right. Not a fad. Um, customers are also interested in HDR. And the standard will be ratified before long. That will provide even more color depth, and that basically gives you greater film-like looks in, in terms of shadow detail and brightness. Um, the image looks quite a bit more lifelike than standard imagery does today on television. So these consume enormous amounts of storage, I assume. Absolutely. When you go up in resolution and then when you go up in color depth, you very quickly grow the size of the file significantly. And that is yet another type of flavor that you need to make when you're producing a video streaming archive, for instance. Okay, okay. so growth, huge issue. So I assume scalability then is a, a significant requirement when we're talking about uh, designing cloud or designing uh, storage architectures for media. So what else is important? Uh, protection? Right, security is key. You need to ensure that only you have access to the data and only the people you grant access to have access to the specific bits of data you want. An example would be if you have a massive data archive that is uh, proprietary to your company, you want to ensure that you can provide dis distribution for elements of that and have great controls over who gets at that data. And of course, no one else does. So access control, encryption, things like that are important when you're storing these very, very valuable assets. Yes. What about, um, what about just generally what the, losing the assets? What about durability? Right. It becomes very expensive to have multiple copies and manage multiple copies from a version syncing standpoint and such. So having a highly durable single point source is lovely. Paying someone else to manage that storage for you, extremely valuable. When you do it on-prem, you end up having high availability storage, you have cooler storage, you have mountains of tapes that are stored both on-prem and in cold storage off. And I imagine this is how a lot of companies do it today. So high durability is a key requirement. You, you, you likely, and companies today likely have multiple replicas in order to meet that durability requirement. They're often contra contractually required to have three, depending on the type of work. Uh, what about availability? How important is that? Yeah, availability is critical. On the project that you may be working on, having the media available to you randomly is key. 
if it takes you hours to be able to pull the data back or even days, if you have to online the data from tape and the tape may not be on premises, it takes hours to get it or up to potentially three days to get the data back overnight, online it, look at it and realize you didn't restore enough of it or you restored too much of it and therefore it took too long to restore. And there's often dependencies that are found in that restored data that then point to other data that you then have to repeat the process. So on-demand on demand availability is key. Correct, and, and that was only a local restore. Uh, right. You know, you're then in a scenario where if some, if you have a global office elsewhere and the data is not local to them, you have to work with the time zone of that local office to get that data back and then ship it to where you are. Or imagine a consumer that's in India might want to listen to a music file, or someone who's in Paris may want to see an image, a photograph that is stored, some rich media file asset, and so the ability to have that on-demand access globally. Yes. Is important. Okay, yeah, great. consumers are definitely focused on getting things on demand and globally. I mean, the web services all provide that today. Great, great. And then you also, I know you also talk a little bit about um, the importance from an availability standpoint of just generally knowing what the heck you have. Right. Yes, I've worked with customers who have large vaults, and I'm talking a cabinet with hard drives in them, and there'll be handwritten post-it notes with an elastic band around them, <laughs> and that's the limit of the knowledge of the data. And they said, yes, the people who wrote those notes aren't here anymore, but we've passed it down over time. Uh, and that's, that's unfortunate in the fact that how do you get at that data? You yeah. literally have to take that hard drive and mount it in a machine that has the correct interface, and then it's hopefully running the right OS to be able to pull that data off, and then you have to sift through it. Um, that's a horribly expensive task in terms of human time, and so th the question is whether or not that data actually gets read again. So the value of that data may be really high, but the usefulness of it, the value of it, though, to, to you, the IP owner, is really low, and the fact that you can't get at it. Because the cost is high. Got it. So a rich metadata model might be something that would be valuable so that you can describe these media assets in a rich way and be able to uh, have easy access and, and essentially uh, better availability to them. Absolutely. Great. Great. Okay, so we've heard, um, I guess to summarize, I've, what I've heard is scalability is important. Yes. Media files are growing uh, in incredibly fast. Uh, flexibility, so you need to be able to support small files and large files. You need to be able to self-describe the files or, or have the files described in some way with rich metadata. Security, protection, durability, and then generally availability are important. Yes, yeah, the global availability is the, the really the exciting bit. Um, it's been challenging working in the field with multiple offices globally, and you're having to rely on file synchronization, dedicated links, multiple file systems in each of the disparate offices that then require synchronization. Um, that, there's a lot of overhead. There's, there's multiple people required to make sure that system works. Um, with a central global repository, you can just have individuals access the data they need. That, for me, that's super exciting from an availability standpoint. Fantastic, fantastic. So now that we've chatted some about the interesting requirements for storage and storing media, I'd like to touch on object storage and cloud storage and how those fit many of the requirements that Jeff just mentioned. Then I'll introduce cloud storage and provide a brief overview of how Google Cloud Storage is different. So a blob store or an object store is a storage architecture that manages data as objects versus a storage architecture like a file system which manages data as a file hierarchy or block storage, which manages data as blocks within sectors or tracks. So two tenets of object storage that make them popular choice for managing media and media assets are first, they're a flat, flexible, and scalable uh, system. So traditional storage, as I mentioned, relies on a file system hierarchies, which create certain upper limits on scalability and performance. Object storage doesn't have that limitation. As Jeff mentioned, scalable performance is a critical aspect of storing and accessing media files. Object stores also provide flexibility on the size of objects. The second thing is object stores provide a robust and flexible metadata layer, metadata capabilities. As objects are stored with the data, they also have an address and this robust and flexible metadata. So the metadata flexibility compared to other types of storage addresses some of the accessibility concerns that Jeff mentioned earlier. More metadata means better access and better control. So object storage isn't perfect, it doesn't solve all problems, but it does bring simplicity and flexibility to access and scale for storing media files. If you understand object storage and why it's such a popular choice, I'd like to touch a little bit now on object storage in the cloud. Object storage in the cloud adds additional benefits, um, in, such as um, first, scale becomes global. Jeff talked about scale and how critical it was. 
scale becomes global with global data centers. So the larger the cloud, the more capacity you can use to store your media assets that may come during periods of unpredictable growth. So Google manages one of the largest clouds in the world, supports many, many, many exabytes of storage. Next, object storage in the cloud can be uh, more available. So major cloud providers provide data centers all over the globe. At Google, we have more than 100 edge locations in 33 countries. Data will stay online, which is a stark in stark contrast to tape storage. Also, data can be accessed with simple RESTful APIs. Third, cloud storage should be, could be, and likely is more durable. A well-constructed cloud will deliver highly redundant, geographically diverse storage. In the case of Google Cloud Storage, we offer 11.9's durability across all tiers of object storage. And finally, a well-constructed cloud should be even more secure. While a few years ago, some people believed cloud was less secure because they didn't manage security themselves, today, I think most people agree that a well-run cloud provider benefits from having a very, very large and very focused team providing security. At Google, we've got something like more than 600 people whose job it is to protect our cloud infrastructure. So overall, as with, with any cloud, any cloud service, uh, much of the heavy lifting is designed uh, is, is designing a durable, secure, scalable cloud is outsourced. So it lets you focus on what you're doing best. W would you say, Jeff, that, that those key requirements, scalability, durability, availability, um, are the, some of the key tenets that uh, people who are managing and uh, the media assets are looking for? Absolutely. The opportunity to be able to get at any file, any time, super valuable. The uh, example I can give would be um, I was on a production where we had to get, um, there, there was a directorial change and they needed access to a file. That, that never happens. Never happens. Directors never change their mind. Um, <laughs> so in that context, we needed to bring a, an asset back online that had been moved off of the fast storage, essentially. Um, and the version um, was you know, available, but we had, to, we had to pull it back. And it was going to take about a day and a half to get that data just because it was another office and such. So um, when I moved to another firm where 100% of the data was online in terms of archival, we were able to restore the data back in just a couple of minutes. You could just change your shot directory, go over to where you needed to find the file and pull it back. And that emulates the exact work use model that we have for Google Cloud Platform. You can go and pull the files back in just a couple of seconds and you have access to the entire data set. So that the, the cost savings on, on the several days of people time and schedule time, um, wall clock as we call it, um, was huge. Great, yeah, yeah, I've heard that story, types of those stories uh, over and over again. It's the accessibility, the availability of the data, and then what you can do with it, and the time that you save in trying to pull that data back is one of the key benefits of having an object store and having a cloud object store. Uh, absolutely, when you look at the total cost of ownership for on-premise storage in terms of people time, and the number of days, if you're on a schedule of any kind, and you have even add up the salaries of all of the people, and add that to your total cost of overhead, and every day it takes you longer to complete it because you're pulling storage, either you're offline or on online data to try and find it. Um, that's all real cost. Great, great. So we've talked a little bit about the requirements for, for media and managing media files and media assets. We then moved on and talked a little bit about how Object Store is a different uh, approach um, that is really meets a lot of those requirements, and then how Cloud Object Store uh, is uh, is really a, 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 a even better approach. Um, so if you're managing media assets, or if you will in the future, um, I, I guess I guess um, you, you may ask the question, you know, why Google, um, and, and what what's unique about Google. So now I'd like to transition into how Google and Google Cloud Storage is different. Google's had to cope with massive amounts of data because of its grand scale. Google services are truly global generating exabytes and exabytes of data. A secret to Google's continuing success team stems from the fact that Google is able to operate at this scale before anyone else and at price points, order of magnitudes less expensive than competitors. So as a result, there are a few distinct advantages to our scale and our experience. Google Cloud Storage lets you store your media assets on a global, globally available, highly secure and efficient infrastructure. Our object store is differentiated in several ways. First, we deliver massive, massive scalability. Have I said that yet? You have. Massive scalability. Scale. Have I said lots and lots of exabytes? Yeah, many. How it, many? It, it, many, many, many. Can't tell you exactly, but mm -hmm. many, many, many. I'm growing rapidly. We have as much capacity as anyone needs. Um, one customer came to us 
a, a while ago and asked for um, several hundred petabytes because they couldn't procure storage quickly enough. And they said they were they wanted to grow into uh, maybe a couple of exabytes. Now, as a storage guy, that's a lot of storage. That is an, an unbelievable amount of storage. And we honestly didn't have any concerns. No, when they asked how many, you know, if they could have an exabyte of data, we could arrogantly respond with how many exabytes would you like? Yes, exactly. Second, our global network. Our global network is a huge differentiator. We've got built-in edge cache capabilities where we keep your data on our network as long as we possibly can, and we automatically store replicas near where objects are most frequently requested. So this means better availability and hence a better user experience, a customer experience with your media assets. Our network, as I mentioned before, has more than 100 edge locations in 33 countries for caching. And you'll be tested on this. 133, keep those numbers. That's a quiz. And uh, we're the only cloud provider that actually has laid fiber, laid cables across um, both oceans. So can you talk a little bit about the use case? I have data in Europe and I want to read it in America, and then I want to read it in Singapore as well. Can you talk a little bit about how the buckets work? And well, well, really, it, it, it comes down to you know, a key differentiator as we talk about, the, as, as you talked about, the requirements for media assets to be global in nature, right? The person in India or Chicago or Singapore needing access to these. Right, because the work is often done in multiple locations and delivered elsewhere. Or the customer, or or the customer yeah. is in multiple locations. You may be uh, web serving, you, you may be serving, serving out um, images, or, or you may be uh, serving out videos, right? The customer might, might be in various locations. And because we have our own network, we own our network, it's one of the huge advantages. We've created uh, a, uh, we, we, um, we, we've been pioneers in creating um, uh, ways to uh, optimize, best optimize uh, data movement uh, you know, across um, large uh, distances. So for a customer that does have a global operation that wants global access to their data, uh, that's really one of our you know, key differentiators. In addition to the, to the network, um, we also are optimized for reading very large files. So we've optimized for server-side throughput, meaning we simply um, are faster in reading large files. Um, and, and this really comes from our legacy in YouTube and Photos and Google Play. And that means that your customers have a better experience when they use your media. The fourth reason is our pricing. It's both low and simple to understand. Uh, we have uh, frequently declining prices as opposed to, uh, say, you know, again, as a storage guy, purchasing storage hardware that has got to be capitalized over three years. And on average, we're 13 to 15 percent lower than our closest cloud competitor. Um, and, you know, the thing, the feedback that I get so much from customers is it's just much simpler to understand. The fifth uh, major thing I'll call out for Google Cloud Storage Differentiators is what I, I'm just calling value-added services. It can be applied against your data when it's in our cloud. You know, this goes back to your accessibility uh, comment earlier, Jeff, where you know if you if you can uh, uh, leverage, uh, if you can apply systems against um, uh, services against the data, you can create more value for your customers. So massive scalability, global network large read file throughput, pricing, and these value-added services, which I'll let you talk about in a couple minutes. Make sense? It does. Great. So I just briefly wanted to introduce Google Cloud Storage, the actual service itself. We've got three flavors, standard, durable, reduced availability, and nearline storage. Uh, they all come with 11.9's durability target, and they primarily differ in price and availability. Standard storage offers 99.9% .9 availability SLA, it's ideal for workloads that require performance, availability, and durability. So it's sort of the standard, maybe the premium one. Durable reduced availability is exactly what it says. It's highly durable, and it has a slightly reduced availability SLA at 99%. So it's ideal for workloads that can accept the occasional unavailability, um, so for instance, uh, batch workloads. Finally, nearline storage is our newest storage offering. And this is ideal, ideally designed as a cool storage pool uh, this is uh, only a penny a gig per month, um, but it comes with a penny uh, read penalty uh, per gig, um, and it's ideal for infrequently accessed media such as uh, backup files um, or even archive files. So with that, um, Jeff, uh, I'd, like, I'd love for you to talk about that fifth thing I mentioned on the previous slide, which was the value-added services. So we talked a lot about the benefits of moving to an object store, the benefits of moving to a cloud, and benefits of moving to, to Google's infrastructure. But where I think a lot of excitement is today is what can you do with the data once it's in the cloud, once it's in our cloud? 
Absolutely. One of the really cool things about Google is the leadership and the lead that we have in machine learning technology. It is not an overly exciting conversation to say, what does a gig cost? And Hey, you know, wait, hold on a second. <laughs> well, it can be. But for me, what's more compelling is things like the Cloud Translate API that we have, the ability to have 80 plus languages available. You can put one language in, auto language detection, you can get another language out, and that works across both text as well as speech. So we have a cloud speech API, and that will allow you to have both batch as well as streaming audio. So you can, as people are familiar with, talk into your phone, that can be in one language. We can do a translate to text for that. We can do a, a, or a actual language translation with that. And using the cloud natural language API, we can then do a context awareness of what was said what was relevant about that and be able to deconstruct the language and get the sentiment of what the user is looking for. So this, this sounds like a corner case. It sounds like a, something that may not apply to a lot of people, but the, the concept that there's this service that's really innovative service that you're applying now against your data that you otherwise couldn't have done if you're just sitting on a tape somewhere, I think that's really compelling. Absolutely, yeah. From, from an imagery standpoint, I'd encourage you to download Google Photos. It's free, it's available for iOS and Android. You can choose to compress your images a little bit with JPEG and there's no limit on what you can upload if you choose that option. And the nice thing about it is you can put thousands and many, many thousands, tens of thousands of images up um, and the server on the back end will do the metadata analysis for you. So if you type in Golden Gate Bridge or you type in cat or you know any of the search terms for imagery that you may have, you'd be amazed at the accuracy and the speed with which the imagery can be presented to you. So the, the, the Vision API um, is fantastic. You can feed it a significant amount of imagery and get back highly relevant scored metadata and it comes to you with a percentage of accuracy. Um, it includes um, face detection, it includes uh, emotion, and um, you can you know, decide if someone is, is, is angry or sad or pensive. Um, there's all sorts of you know, different complexities built, in, built into the model. You can show it an image of two kittens and it'll tell you what kind of kittens they are. Um, it's, a, it's a really, really compelling use case. But what's interesting to me is taking a massive multi-petabyte or multi-hundred petabyte archive that you may have and onlining that under the cloud and then running metadata analysis against it with the Vision API, that allows you to then get at that data. It becomes cataloged, it becomes useful, you're able to monetize that, and you're able to either resell it or make it available to consumers or make it available to your employees in the company, depending on the type of data. Um, and that's just the current roadmap of what we have. There's more products coming soon, um, backed by our machine learning technology. We also have big query and big data analytics um, Google is extremely adept at handling large amounts of data with huge numbers of queries per second to be able to data mine and come up with relevant responses on massive data sets to the queries you have. So if you have large data that you want to work with, please use our tools. They're really fantastic. In addition, we also offer transcoding for media use cases. If you have images or video that is in one format, you need it in another. We offer everything from roll your own FFmpeg solutions to fully managed backed solutions um, with partners. And um, the transcoding use case, again, is, is especially compelling. It runs extremely well on our per minute cloud. Um, and the massive amount of storage we have means you can transcode everything in parallel and be able to deliver it globally. Fantastic. So these are some good examples of once you move your data to the cloud, you can apply things like machine learning, analytics. You can, can potentially apply other innovative services that are coming from Google in the future uh, that really creates some differentiation based upon your data. Absolutely, you can also roll your own as well. Our open source TensorFlow product is, well, open source. You can download it, make your own graphs, and you can run your own models against your data as well. Yeah. Um, we're all about open, so if you want to run containers locally and then run them on data you have in the cloud, um, that, that's fully portable. Great, great. So so we, we, we've talked about some of the differentiators of GCS. Um, and now, now let's let's take a, a second and, and dive into, or at least talk a little bit about. So, how are customers actually using this? I mean, who's using Google Cloud Storage? Who's using Cloud Storage generally? Object Store? You know, are there are they managing media files, and, and what kind of companies are doing that? Great. Well, we have Vimeo, which is a um, very popular video streaming service. We have Snapchat for social media. We have Spotify for music streaming. Ubisoft for gaming. We have. Wix for websites. We have Ignite for file sharing. Uh, Khan Academy that everyone is familiar with. Uh, some fantastic 
large videos available there. Uh, in addition, JDI for file sharing as well. Great, great. So those are some, some great brand names that are using um, Google Cloud Storage for, uh, for, for, for storing their and managing their media assets. So, I mean, with that, let's talk a little bit about, um, about next steps. So if, if, if you're managing media assets, or if you will in the future, um, where to get started? So there's several patterns we've seen on how people get started using Google Cloud Storage for managing their media assets. First, serving globally. So our multi-regional, geo-redundant storage, lightning fast network, large file read, read throughput, performance, and scale make GCS an ideal storage pool for serving media files. Second, transcoding. Transcoding and data processing. So our regional DRA ability to burst workloads, again, our global network, our Envato services, make this great for some of the services that Jeff mentioned earlier, layering on top of your media files. And third, archiving and disaster recovery. So with low predictable price, including no ingress fees, consistent set of APIs across all three tiers, and an instant on-demand access, make this an ideal service for archiving and disaster recovery. That's an excellent point. With Nearline, we've re we've reduced the latency down so it's it's incredibly quick. It's it's under a second uh, for read, and we've also removed the throttling on egress. So the larger the size of pipe you have, the more quickly obviously we can send send the data to you. And that high predictability allows you to know what it would cost if you want to bring back 400 terabytes of data. You know how long it'll take, and you know what it'll cost. And that's really important in a DR scenario. That you're exactly right. It's not just a question of a low of low price or low cost of storing uh, your, your assets for a long period of time, but the fact that you have predictability on, on recovery is a key aspect that customers seem to really like. So with that, I'm gonna wrap up. Um, if you're managing media, uh, if you're managing media assets, cloud storage, Google Cloud Storage offers you a low cost solution that can scale, 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 let you focus on what you do best to differentiate your business. The great thing about cloud is it's easy to try. I recommend the try, train, and engage process. Information is plentiful online, and we're here to help you be successful. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks for watching.